Hello and welcome to Connect and Collaborate. I'm Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer for the show. This week we are talking about higher education and uh, the exciting thing about this is that Wednesday we have a um, an event that we are hosting, the State of Higher Education Forum. And we're going to have um, a few chancellors and a few presidents coming in for that and we are very excited to host that at History Colorado. Go ahead and get your tickets at cobrt.com slash events. Today I have with me Christy Strether, who's the Journalism Department Chair at the Community College of Denver, or lovingly known as CCD, my alma mater as well. And I also have on phone with me the President of CCD, Everett Freeman. Hello, Everett. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for the call. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And um, so I just wanted to jump right in here to the conversation, I guess. Everett, um, we all know that there's different paths to careers, right? And one of those paths is the community college system. And I don't think they get as much of a shout out for a higher education as they should. So go ahead and give us just an overview of what you think the community college role is in higher education. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about community colleges. You know, there are over 1,100 community colleges in the United States, and what we do as a sector is we provide that opportunity to uh, allow students to achieve at an affordable price a high-quality education at least to transfer to either a regional or an Ivy League institution, and we've been doing that for over 100 years. One of the great investors in higher education, a former owner of the Washington Redskins football team, Jack Kent Cook, has created a scholarship exclusively for students who transfer from community colleges to four-year institutions. And students in community colleges across the country have benefited from that uh, scholarship and from the support in our state of people like uh, our current governor, the Denver Scholarship Foundation and other organizations that are committed to allowing and helping students who want to complete an associate degree at a two-year institution and subsequently transfer it to a four-year institution. Or if they don't want to do that, if they simply want to come to refresh their skills or to acquire new skills and achieve a certificate along the way, we provide those opportunities. And we've been doing that at Community College of Denver for 50 years. Wow, 50 years. That's this year, right? Right. We've been celebrating this year our 50th anniversary. It's really exciting around campus. Oh, yeah. well, I had to graduate the year before, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Missing out on all those opportunities. Well, Everett, uh, t give us a little bit about your background. How did you end up at CCD? Well, I've gone full circle in my career. When I started out as an instructor, I was teaching in what was the non-traditional evening program at Rutgers University in New Jersey. My first class started at 6.40 in the evening, and my last class ended at 10.25 that evening. So I started out teaching non-traditional students, men and women who usually worked or who were home uh, makers and who came to school in the evening. And this gave me an opportunity coming to Denver to come full circle to end up where I began, working with non-traditional students working with students who come directly out of uh, homes where they very often are first generation to attend college or where they are from immigrant families or where they simply have never had the uh, opportunity to achieve a higher education degree. So I'm in the sweet spot in my career returning to my uh, starting point and I'm loving every minute of it. Oh, fantastic, that's so good to hear. Everett, do you have a favorite story that you've, um, that touches your heart from the community college system. Let me tell you the story that had the most impact on me, and that's graduation day. When I look out at a sea of graduates, oftentimes for us it's four or 500 students graduating in May, and we'll be doing that this coming May 10. And I look out and I see an ocean of pure joy, not only on the faces of those who are graduating, receiving certificates and associate degrees, but the members of their family, many times four, five, six, even a dozen members of a family who come to that commencement program to bear witness to that family member having achieved something very often that no one in their family has achieved before. And that's, as the young people would say, that's the, the dope that keeps me in this business, the, the just the pure joy that I see on the faces of those 
family members and graduates doing their commencement uh, program. There's nothing that compares to that in my life at all. I love that. Um, and sadly enough, I actually did not make it to my graduation. I had to work um, <laughs> because I, I was a non-traditional student. I had a full-time job. I was interning and I was going to school full-time. And so that's one of the things that I really loved about CCD, right? I was able to pick up those evening classes and work around my schedule. Mm -hmm. And um, and Christy, um, whom I will, I'm forever thankful to you <laughs> for uh, helping me get set on my career. Um, she had lovely classes and I was able, because I was a flight attendant at the time, I was able to take some classes during the week. And so I got to enjoy that also, you know, regular student schedule as mm -hmm. well. Um, so I like that there's a good mix that CCD offers that for everyone across the board, right? And we have lots of online classes as well at CCD. Um, Christy, do you have a story about the community college system that you would like to share with us? Well, I agree with Everett. I think graduation is a real special night. Uh, I also like the more personal experiences with students that come to my office and we work real hard on their applications for four-year universities. We just this week have been hearing a lot of students that got accepted into some pretty prestigious colleges, Pepperdine, Columbia. Wow. And so our students are working really hard yeah. and I'm getting to see them transfer to some really strong schools to continue their education. I also have a lot of students like you yeah. who yeah. complete um, their degree at CCD and then get some successful yeah. opportunities in the industry and so that's real fun. So I have a lot of uh, joy when I hear about students um, achieving their dreams through CCD and then yeah. out into the industry. Oh, I love that. That's well, and I, as you said, I am one of those students, yeah. right? I, um, I did do a degree with designation. So if I need to go back and continue and get my bachelor's, I certainly can do that. Um, but I didn't need to, I have my associates, I have my journalism certificate and I'm doing quite well. I mm -hmm. like, <laughs> I'd like to think. Good. Yeah, so, um, Everett, uh, you said that you started out with non-traditional students. What, what made you decide that that was the career path you wanted to take in education? Well, you know, I had the great fortune of being at uh, private universities, four-year institutions. Uh, I was provost at the University of Indianapolis. I've had the benefit of teaching at state universities in a number of states, Rutgers University where I started, then Michigan State, uh, Tennessee State University, and ending up as president of a public four-year institution with graduate programs in Georgia Albany State University. And what I find about the non-traditional student that is so exciting for me is that non-traditional students and first-generation students in particular have no sense of entitlement. They <laughs> come to our institutions with a firm commitment to succeed, and many of them say to themselves, succeed at all costs. And they are so energized and so focused in what they do because they don't have a silver spoon to fall back on. They don't have a family resource to fall back on. They, in many instances, are the resource that their family looks to for that movement into the middle class, that movement into the American dream. So I find traditional students to be really good students. I find non-traditional students to be better. I like that. Uh, and I, I have to concur with you. I started out um, at 18. I went to Ball State University. So um, I got that Indiana background with you there. Um, and I I wasn't paying for it. My parents were, I would skip classes and it's, I, you know, um, I was 18. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I got about three years under my belt at Ball State University and it just wasn't for me. Um, so I pursued a path in travel and I got a lot of traveling under my belt, which was wonderful. I was so happy to be able to do that. But it led me to CCD, right? I knew at some point I needed a, a degree and I wanted to find my passion. And so CCD really allowed me to do that. But I tell you what, I had a different appreciation for it when it came out of my own pocket. I wasn't entitled. I made it to every class and I would overhear younger students talking about skipping class. And I'm like, do you know you're missing out on $65 right now? <laughs> you might as well just flush that down the toilet. Yeah. So I completely agree with you, Everett. There is a 
no sense of entitlement for non-traditional students. And I, I'm glad that you've been able to harbor that at CCD as the president there. So um, tell me what's going on. So we're celebrating 50 years at CCD. What else um, is big on campus right now? Well, let me talk about some of the programs we have because that's the secret sauce for us. We offer 115 degree programs and 46 certificate programs. So if you've got an area where you're interested in studying, we almost will have in every instance that program either on our books so we can tailor or design a program that can meet your needs. And here's the payoff. We did a study a couple of years ago when we asked, among other things, what is the economic impact of an associate degree? And what we find that the difference between an uh, individual attaining simply a high school degree and that individual going on to get an associate degree, which is 60 credits at a, a regional accredited institution beyond high school, that individual over a lifetime will earn a hundred and uh, 400, I'm sorry, $477,000 more, a half a million dollars more, wow. the difference between a high school degree and an associate degree over a lifetime. That amounts to literally $11,000 every year in increased earnings by getting that associate degree. That's life changing. And that's the reason why we encourage students to consider if their resources don't allow them to go to a four-year institution, or even if their resources do allow them to go to a four-year institution, to consider starting at an associate degree level, getting that associate degree, because things can happen between that associate degree and those last two years that can oftentimes delay or prevent an individual from getting a four-year degree. But with that associate degree, we know that the individual has an opportunity to go out and to provide for his or her family and make a difference. Let me just give you one other statistic that, that I like to remind people about. We oftentimes talk about what is the rate of return on an investment. If you invested in a savings account in the United States today, the average rate of return on that savings account is less than a 1%. It's 0.6%, less than a percent. If you invested in the stock market, the average rate of return on your stock portfolio is 7.2%. If you invest in an associate degree, the average rate of return on an associate degree is 15.4%. That means that an associate degree is a better investment than the stock market, a better investment than a savings account, a better investment than anything else there out there we know about. And when students hear that that rate of return is achievable, just by simply going for that associate degree, it makes a lot of sense in terms of dollars and cents for them. And so I like to remind people the absolute rate of return that you get once you get that associate degree beats the stock market, beats the money market account, beats the savings account any day. That, those are some amazing statistics. I love that. 0.6%, less than a full percent for savings, and 15.4% for an associate. So it's a huge leap. Um, Average rate of return. Exactly. That's, nothing beats an education, in my opinion. No. Yeah, that's, I, you're set for life if you're educated. Um, I did want to ask you, speaking of education and the community college system, there's a little bit of a stigma that resides around a community college, right? You know, it's it's considered not as good as a four-year degree, or it's considered, a, you know, a little bit less than, right? Mm -hmm. Would you like to um, say anything along the lines of disproving that stigma? First of all, I don't buy the stigma. <laughs> Second, we've got a huge uh, array of individuals who have come out of community colleges and who have said, were it not for the community college, I would not be who I am. I remember two years ago, the great actor Tom Hanks, when there was a discussion about uh, free community college education across the country. We recall President Obama proposed that Tom Hanks wrote a beautiful piece in the national media talking about the teachers that he had starting out in his career as a community college student and the impact that they had and how they helped shape his thinking about what he wanted to do with his life. Story after story after story, 
I know of exist where those individuals attribute their successes to community colleges. My oldest grandson, I think one of the brightest kids I know, of course, I am biased. <laughs> he decided rather than go on to a four-year institution starting out, he wanted to do his first two years at community college. Thrived at the community college and is now at the University of Maryland having a wonderful time. And he says to me that his faculty member asked him, well, how do you know this? Uh, since the other students in their third year class don't, he said, I learned it my first year at community college. Student after student can tell that same story. Christy Struthers students can tell that story with regard to what they know and what they learn and what skills they've amassed as journalism students while attending community college of Denver. Well, I just think there's a lot of um, positives out in the industry right now, and there's a lot of initiatives at the state level that is giving more support to community colleges, and I think that shows how important community colleges are when we're looking at compared to four-year universities. Absolutely. I, did, you, did you have a, anything that you would like to share stigma-wise, right, f to combat that stigma about community college being not as good as? Well, and I think it goes back to our diverse population. I think we are the place for a diverse um, student to come and to feel um, what it's like to be in education. And I think that uh, the stigma is inaccurate because I think there's a lot of success at CCD and community colleges in the system where um, I do believe we are getting um, more recognition. Mm -hmm. We're winning a lot of awards. I know, for example, uh, when we have our student publication go up against four-year universities, we have been winning. We have been beating a lot of the universities that have bigger programs, more money, more students, and we are right there winning first and second place over those big universities. And so the stigma is inaccurate, and I think it's changing, though. I think a lot of people, including the state of Colorado, is seeing the benefits of uh, community college education. I would agree with you there. That's, um, And you do bring up a very great point, right? The, the Colorado, the state of Colorado, we're looking at workforce development, right? So one of the things that we're missing out, we're missing out on trades, a lot of places, right? And you don't really even need a degree for that. Sometimes it's just a certificate. Sometimes it's just a year of classes, right? To get the right training for these tradesmen jobs. And, and one of the other stigmas that's out there is like manufacturing work. Um, tends to have a negative connotation with it, right? It's dirty, it's gross, you're on a line, but that's not at all what it's like anymore. Um, and so I, I think pushing students to pursue a different path besides the traditional four years, four year degree, I, I believe that Colorado is on the cutting edge of that. And I think it's fantastic. Um, any more thoughts let me on add that? Something. Yeah, let yeah. me add something there. I don't think that uh, the discussion about either or is a helpful discussion. It's really about all rather than either or. Individuals at varying points in their career have various ways in which they want to approach the uh, the work world, various ways they want to approach education. And so the idea that an individual has to, in a very linear fashion, go straight through wherever that journey takes them, it, it's really fictional. What we really have is individuals who start out, uh, we know from the research that individuals who attend four-year institutions, on average, change their major five or more times. Wow. Uh, we also know that, on average, individuals who start out in a four-year degree oftentimes don't finish until six years. So the notion that there is a set reality for students going into the educational sector, it's just wrong-headed. And I think that's why when Colorado set up its 13 college community college system, it did so in the, with the idea of making a community college available within 100 miles where the individual lived, anywhere in the state of Colorado. In fact, some say within 50 miles, anywhere within the state of Colorado. And the 13 of those community colleges have relationships and partnerships and articulation agreement with every four-year institution in this state. And every one of those four-year institutions realizes that its success depends on the success of the community colleges. So there really isn't an either-or, and there really isn't a stepsister, stepbrother, class 
structure within community college is what each of the sectors does best. Community colleges are not best at being for research. And research institutions are not best at teaching women how to weld. And we all recognize those things, and we do what we do best in our lanes, and those lanes are permeable, and people go in and out of those lanes. I think it's the Colorado system designed and intended it to work, and I think it works really well. I agree. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I took the words right out of my mouth. I definitely agree with you there. Um, we've got about four minutes here to wrap up. Um, Christy, what's going on at Community College of Denver right now? What are some events that we're looking at? Well, we have a lot of events from all of our departments, um, from, you know, the creative writing department. Um, we also have a big uh, regional conference coming up in April, <clears throat> April 20th and 21st. It's the Society of Professional Journalists. We will have four states on our campus with media professionals and students from a variety of colleges. Um, we also have, of course, in other departments, we have wonderful, our art department is doing art shows. We have a music program that does recitals. So we always, we have a very lively, um, very engaged um, activities here at CCD. I think that we can always look forward to doing more. And I think that CCD has really developed a system to help us um, take what we learn in the classroom, what our students learn in the classroom and apply it um, in a bigger, broader uh, spectrum, and I think that's exciting. That is exciting. I, it was one of the things that I really enjoyed uh, when I attended CCD as well, is getting to go to those events and seeing lots of speakers, right? You guys get some really top name speakers that come down to CCD, and it's very exciting. Um, I, did you have one recently? A guest speaker? Yes. Um, well, we t we've been taking our students outside of the classroom. We've been doing okay. a lot in the industry with um, some of the other mediums, the newspapers, magazines, radio. Yeah. Um, so we've been really focusing in the journalism department of showing students what is out there in the workforce. Oh, nice. Yeah. I like that a lot. But Everett, have you heard of any other departments bringing in some special guest speakers? I believe the paralegal department had a big event a week ago. Uh, I want to add one thing, uh, just because I know we're getting close to time, but it relates to the question that you've asked, and that is we talked about the return on investment. We didn't say anything about costs. And what we're discovering is that, is that many savvy families are asking their young people, particularly those who are traditional age students, you want to do the first two years. Do you want to spend $18,000 for those first two years or roughly $6,000 a semester? Or do you want to spend $2,116 a semester is what we charge at a community college for that first semester at our community college? And many parents are saying, look, I'd rather pay half price for the first two years, set you up with getting all A's in the first two years, then you go to your four-year institution and you hit every scholarship out of the park. Some students who go to a four-year institution would do better, not only in terms of academics, but certainly in terms of dollars and cents if they started out of a two-year institution, simply because we, we literally charge half of what the four-year institutions charge, not because we're cheap, not because <laughs> our quality is diminished in any, uh, any way, shape, or form, but because we don't have the additional cost of research and the additional cost that goes with research. We can be far more affordable to families and students who want to get those first two years done at a cost-effective price. And we are urging parents of all economic uh, uh, circumstances to take a look at us in terms of the quality and the cost. And we believe we can beat the competition on both quality and cost combined. Well said, Everett. Thank you so much for joining me today on Connect and Collaborate. Stay tuned with us. We'll be back in about five minutes. Hello and welcome back to Connect and Collaborate. I am Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer. Today and all week long, we are talking higher education here on Connect and Collaborate, and I have with me Christy Strether, who is the Journalism Department Chair for the Community College of Denver, or as I like to call it, CCD. It's much easier that way. <laughs> uh, so welcome, Christy. How are you today? Thank you. I'm doing great, and I love to be here. Oh, awesome. I'm so glad. We've had yeah. you on a few times, and um, actually... 
the fun part about this is that I um, found this job because of you. <laughs> I uh, was a student at CCD. I graduated in 2017, and one of the um, I so I got a degree, and I also got a certificate in journalism. Um, but I cannot thank you enough because I ended up here on your first radio um, interview that you did with Connect and Collaborate. They told you that they were looking for an intern, and lo and behold, my name popped up. <laughs> and I pursued an internship here, and then once I graduated, they asked me to stay, and they can't get rid of me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're lucky to have you. You worked really hard at CCD, and you're doing a great job now. I'm real proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> that means a lot. It really does. Um, but Chrissy, the reason I have you here is to talk about journalism and CCD, right? So um, there's a little bit of nuance here on how to get that certificate and what that means for um, somebody with an associate's degree looking to pursue a career in the field of journalism. If you wouldn't mind going over that for me. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, and actually with the um, certificate, it's the Multimedia Journalism Certificate at CCD. And in 2010, the state of Colorado approved our program. It is a six-course, 18-credit certificate. And what students can do is they can come to CCD. Uh, we have four required courses that they need to take anything from broad mass media to magazine writing to a class in new media to really understand how media is changing. We also have a reporting class and some of those classes you can take any order that you want to take them in. Students can maybe take one class and then uh, wait a semester, take another. So there's no order or real deadline with a certificate. I wanted it that way so students had a lot of flexibility. Yeah. And then we also have some electives. And some of those electives can be within journalism or advertising. We also have some graphic design for students that really want a niche market with journalism. And we also allow internships, so as which you <laughs> took advantage of. And a lot of students like doing that with an internship. They could do it on campus, or I have students out in the industry doing their internships um, at a variety of mediums. Absolutely. So it's a real flexible type certificate. And one of those electives I want to uh, talk about, so internships you mentioned on campus, one of those internships can be working for the STAR, right? The Journalism of Excellence, or correct. the Journal of Ex I would like to say the correct title for the STAR, Journal of Excellence. And that's correct. Yes, <laughs> uh, we have, uh, we're in our ninth edition. It'll be oh, wow. published at the end of this month. Um, students work real hard on it. They do everything from writing to the photos, to editing, to putting it together, and then the actual promotion of it as well. So they're learning hands-on skills, trying to work as a team, trying to meet deadlines, and then they have something that's real, that's their own voice. And we've actually been winning some awards too, so it's real exciting for the students after they work all semester to put that together. That's wonderful, and I, I had the opportunity to be published twice in that magazine, which was fantastic for my resume, right? Yes, it's yes. Just, I'm still in school, and I have these two articles that were published in an award-winning magazine, and the reason I was able to do that was because of CCD and the amazing journalism department, right? That's, that was something that I couldn't have asked for a better leg up in the industry. Well, and that's the thing is that we have just tremendous departments and uh, classes that are vital to a student's success. But where I've always focused on is I think students need the real world experience. And that's why I work real hard to um, give them like the Society of Professional Journalists. We have a chapter there where they can network um, the star, where they can actually learn real world experience and those um, strategies and techniques to be successful. So I'm hoping <laughs> that students, you know, learn a lot in the classroom, but they can apply it in other areas. Absolutely. I love that. That's uh, what, honestly, I, when I was trying to decide, when I went back to school to CCD, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do with my life. So I threw spaghetti at a wall and I took a business class and I took a Spanish class <laughs> and I took a journalism class and I said, one of these is going to be up my alley. I'm going to enjoy one of these classes. 
And I absolutely fell in love with journalism immediately, right? And um, I, d I didn't fear that red pin that you have. <gasps> I'm famous for my red pin. Yes. I, I <laughs> should have feared it more, probably. Um, but it, I, it was the tool to help me get on the right path and, you know, um, learn from my mistakes, so to speak. Um, that being said, Christy, you've been with CCD 11 years? I started in 2006. Yes. 2006. Fantastic. So uh, that, tell me what brought you to CCD to begin with. Sure. I actually was teaching in a couple other um, community colleges in the system here in Colorado. Okay. And CCD had a position in the English department. And my background is English and editing and writing. And so when I got hired in the department, I noticed that they only had one journalism class offered. Wow. And so I taught that one journalism class. And I think I had about eight students and so <laughs> the light bulb went off that I needed to do something. And so I had a lot of support from my dean and other faculty members to go for it and to build a certificate, a state certificate, and do other types of outreach in the community. I just had tremendous support. So I went ahead and did it. And now we have a certificate. We have graduates. It's a whole program. Yeah. I have amazing faculty teaching for me. So it's good. I love that. Absolutely. Um, now, one of the things that I would like to tell our listeners here is that Christy has some terrible computers that she needs to get new ones <laughs> in there. <laughs> so if you would like to donate any of your money to the journalism department at CCD, we need to get some new computers in there. How, is, how are those? We semester? still have them, yes. <laughs> oh, no. But we're working on it. Um, you know, we've always got it. There's different... Um, uh, you know, struggles to get things, but um, we're working on getting some newer computers and technology so that Absolutely. we can keep up with everything. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny you mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> it was the one thing that always drove me crazy. <laughs> the computers were just a little bit slow in there, so if you got the good one, you stuck with that the entire semester. semester. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have um, a favorite story of why journalism matters well I don't know if it's a story but I think it's a broader topic that I think it's imperative that students coming in start focusing on how to be um, focus on how to be better readers of media viewers of media so there's a real consumer base of it I think every person should be aware of how their media affects them but I also hope, too, that a lot of my students that go on to working in the industry know how to do accurate, timely, vetted so stories, and um, whether in broadcasting or writing. So I kind of do it twofold. I really want students to understand that media impacts our lives, our culture, and also, too, they can also impact our culture by how they write and how they express themselves whether it's Facebook or podcasting or whatever they might be doing, that we have a real power. Media is powerful, and I hope that students, when they leave the program, they may still fear my red pen, but they have a better awareness of how media impacts them and how they, vice versa, can impact the media. Yes, absolutely. One of the um, movies that I watched in one of your classes, it had Sally Field in it, and she was a reporter. I can't think of the title. Absence of Malice. Absence of Malice. And that one hit me pretty hard, even though it's from the 80s, right? It's a little bit of an older movie. Um, it, it shows you exactly how a story that you're writing can impact so many people and really hurt them, right? Exactly. Um, just, you know, even having um, a story that is, seems minor to someone can impact someone else emotionally, physically, financially. And in that movie that did that, and there's a lot of movies out there from Spotlight. Um, there's quite a few different mov movies that do that. But I hope, I hope your listeners, I hope my students remember that when they are sharing their stories on social media, that they realize there's an audience out there that can be impacted both positive and negative. Absolutely. Um, that was one of the things that I wanted to ask you. So um, what is, do you have an overall theme this semester? I know one of the focuses we took was um, weeding out 
fake news stories, right? Um, so is there any ongoing theme that you've got this semester with your students that you're really honing in on for them? Well, this semester we're still doing a lot with the ethics. Okay. Uh, we're trying to focus on the ethics of journalism. You know, what will you be comfortable printing if you know it hurts somebody? And how do you vet sources? What do you do as a good ethical journalist to make sure your story is accurate and timely and um, kind of conscious of the impact it does. And SPJ has four main principles and one of them is minimize harm. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about that. And I think a lot of people, your listeners may um, relate when they have a Facebook or some sort of social media where it's negative. Mm -hmm. What is the harm being done with these stories? And it's something that we've been focusing on this year a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I can imagine, right, the social media sites are, are blowing up. Facebook just got in a lot of trouble for mm -hmm. selling everyone's uh, <laughs> information. information. Yep. So, um, and I, I think it Facebook was probably well ingrained, I believe, in in boasting these fake sources, these fake news stories, as well as allowing people a place still hidden where we can say whatever we like, right? We're hidden by a computer screen. I would never say something to somebody's face that's malicious, but I'm not stopped on Facebook from typing it. Right. And that's the big issue is we don't know who the sources are. And often um, we don't know if it's a professional journalist saying something that has been researched um, or if it's just someone that's angry at someone or an event and they just want to kind of get a dig in. So it's really hard to know where the news is coming from. We teach our students about certain sites. We do a lot of learning about how to review a site before you believe it. Yeah. I have a lot of students that will read one headline and believe it. Mm -hmm. And so of course we try to fix that and make sure they're reading the whole story and then even go out and look at other stories. Right. To make sure that you understand what the main story is before you start telling other people. Yes. Um, we've had you say this every single time that you've come on, but um, selective exposure. Exposure. That's one of my favorite topics that we went over. And uh, for our listeners that don't know what that is, selective exposure is when you choose the websites that you go on. You choose your news channel. You choose certain mediums, right? You read the same newspapers. You go to the same websites, and you're not allowing yourself to get a full perspective on any issue if you don't look outside of those, right? And so that's right. what selective exposure is. And so I, I just would like your opinion, or I, sort of your lecture on it, um, why that's so harmful. I, yeah, there's two theories and two things that we talk about a lot. And then one of the main ones is selective exposure, where we s seek out media that backs our morals, our beliefs, and our lifestyles. We seek it out. It could be something as simple as, um, you know, what TV show you watch or what magazine you read. But it also really narrows the focus on what else we're learning. Um, and I think a lot of people may have a certain station they want to listen to, and they don't openly, honestly listen to any other views that are being shared and I think that's a real problem. Um, I also think that we have an issue with some people feel afraid to share their view mm -hmm. because it might be in the minority and they don't want to share their view because of the backlash, um, because of how heated it can get quickly if you are opposed to the majority. Yeah. And so those are my two themes in the classes that I teach that we really talk about it as far as really opening your horizons, listening and reading other mediums mm -hmm. that may not be comfortable. Right. And then making sure people don't bully um, and make sure that we can hear other people's views, especially if they're in the minority. Yeah, absolutely. Stop, take a minute, breathe, listen to what the other person has to say. One of my pet peeves is when I can see somebody when I'm talking to them and we're having a discussion about something and we have opposite views. When I can see them mentally picking out things that I'm saying to counter argue, you're not actually sitting and listening to me. You're just picking out words that I've said and you have your arguments ready. And one of the things that I would like to 
expand it, but we'll make sure that everyone knows is to stop and listen. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about selective exposure. And what are the um, what is the one other thing that you really like to go over in journalism? Well, yeah, there's many, but the, <laughs> it's the spiral of silence. Yes. And I just mentioned it just briefly, but it is, it is where especially in the political realm, is where you might have a different view politically on a subject or a candidate, but you will not express your your view because you are in the minority. And so it has this real um, spiral down where you end up not saying anything. Even though you feel firm and confident in your view, you won't say anything in a room or on um, a social media because you are in the minority with that view. And yeah. people won't say it. And I think that's harmful to our society and our culture. And communication should be open whether you're extreme one way or the other. And I don't think we're getting that complete conversation right now. Yeah, absolutely. Any solutions you think we can get there? I think, like you said, just listening um, and really having an open mind. Yeah. I think also, too, to try to put things in context. Um, a lot of times people will hear a, um, one statement or they'll read one headline and they instantly have this overall view or opinion. And I don't think that's accurate. I think we should really read the whole story, go out and check other sources and have a better picture of the full story before we make our opinion. And then, of course, once we have our opinion, then you can share it in full not with obscenities, not with anger, but just to share it in a professional way. Absolutely. Um, do you have a favorite um, story or a favorite part of the class throughout the semester? I know one of uh, the classes you do a restaurant review, mm -hmm. and that is something I know you just had spring break last week, and so the uh, your students are doing it this week, are they not? They did it last week. Okay. Yep, they did it last week, and so they're writing right now, trying to make sure um, they're going back for their second and third review to make sure they're accurate. Yeah. And then so next week I'll start getting to read Absolutely. Their reviews, because that's important. I know a lot of times people want to focus on media in the uh, media subjects, political or local news. Yeah. But restaurants are a vital and important part of our social community. And so we go out and make sure that my students are doing accurate and putting their opinion aside and truly just experiencing that restaurant. Absolutely. It's fun. I enjoy it. We did it last week and we were walking all up and down 16th Street Mall and <laughs> had a good time. Um, I would ask what restaurants they are, but we don't oh, tell them. Oh, secret secrets. Okay, we secret don't tell secrets. them. <laughs> <laughs> we were anonymous. Nobody knew we were there. Yeah. And we went to two different restaurants. Okay. And um, so, yeah, we'll, once the writing is in then we'll announce it yeah absolutely. but it was a fun week <laughs> oh I bet that was uh, that was one of my favorites that I did um I was able to uh review the Domo mm -hmm. um that is a Japanese restaurant just across the street from the CCD campus and um I t that was it was definitely interesting I had never even thought to set foot in there and then we yeah. voted to go there for the restaurant review and um I actually that that story was published in the Star for last last year's magazine. Well, and it's just another way to get students to um, go out and practice what we're learning in the classroom. How can I teach a restaurant review without going out and doing it? No textbook, nothing I could say yeah. would be able to mimic what they learned by l last week sitting in a restaurant and understanding what was going on. So it's a fun, and again, it's another example of trying to get real world experience. Yeah. yeah, I love that. That was definitely bar, bar none. My favorite part of the class was doing the restaurant review. I really enjoyed that. And I did it for a second time because I accidentally took one of your classes twice. Yes. <laughs> well, what was one of the hardest things for you at um, getting your degree? The hardest thing? Turning the question on you. Yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm down for it. I, um, I was very busy. That was uh, one of the things was time management, I would say, which is huge in the journalism industry, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get 15 minutes to turn a story around. And luckily, Christy was easy on us. The most, I think the quickest deadline we ever had was maybe 
two days. Yes. Yes. So, um, which is actually quite a, a lot long of time. time in the real world. <laughs> yes. Two days is not even practical in the real world. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Um, but learning that time management, I think was probably one of the toughest for me because there were definitely several times that I would sit down the night before a paper was due and write it. And I know that it reflected because your red pen would have <laughs> <laughs> torn my paper apart more so than when I would actually sit down and take that week to plan it out and write it and get that down. Um, but as far as the journalism classes go, learning to accept it, uh, critiquing was mm. really tough for me. Um, I had, I've been in an industry being a flight attendant um, where I, did, I don't have a boss around all the time, so I don't get criticized very often on the job. And so learning to take that criticism well um, was hard for me. Right. Okay. Just internally. I never, I don't think, I don't think you ever knew that. I never expressed it. I didn't no. cry and whine about it in class. I would wait until I get home. But <laughs> That's okay though. You know, and I've always said that I don't mind if students are mad at me. Yeah. Um, because then I know that I'm infect, uh, affecting them in ways to get them thinking about their work and their writing. Yeah. Oh, I definitely, there were several times that I thought, how dare she? <laughs> I worked so hard on this. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's something that you definitely have to face in the real world, right? If I don't have my grammar correct on everything that I make for the show that goes on the internet, I have to make sure things are spelled right. I have to make sure that I've gotten the right title down, things like that. Um, so I do appreciate as much as I hated the criticism, I do appreciate having that in my background and I have you to thank for that. Well. I'm glad you were there. And I really, any students that are viewers that are interested, um, I do think journalism is an exciting um, industry right now. Yeah. I think there's a lot of talk about where it's going. Um, I do think, though, we are always going to have stories to tell. So I know that as we might hear, you know, perhaps someone is not doing well in the industry or some business isn't doing well, we've got to think about stories are always going to be told. When are we not going to have an award or a sporting event or tragedy or weather or just news and politics? So I hope people really think about, hope people really think about if they're interested in learning about media. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we have a good certificate program at CCD. There's other schools that do as well. So it's just an important topic, and I hope people think about it more and more as we are embracing the digital age. Absolutely. That's uh, very well said. Um, I, I do think, well, and you know, with uh, Trump coming into presidency, he beat up on the media a lot, mm -hmm. right? Changed a lot of things. Yeah. Um, which I, <clears throat> despite your opinion of Trump, that's something that I, I think the journalism world maybe wasn't quite prepared for, right? We, we, we've been getting mm -hmm. the, he's not a, He's the first president, I would say, to not invite the media around for some of his bigger accomplishments. Yeah, he was the first that didn't use the media to help him yeah. in his presidency. Yeah, he's definitely banned them. And he um, and I, I'm hoping someday <clears throat> that somebody will just set up a Microsoft Word document and tell him <laughs> that that's Twitter and that's where he needs to put his new tweets. So okay. <laughs> they're just safe in a Word document. <clears throat> yeah, and I think that might make a lot of things a little easier for this country. But Christy, thank you so much for joining us today. And it has been my pleasure. I always love coming down. Oh, thank you so much. And have a wonderful day. Be sure to like and subscribe on our YouTube page, as well as listen to this podcast and more at cobrt.com slash radio dash podcast. Thank you. Great.